gift of life that you've bestowed upon each and every one of us. We count this, dear Lord, a privilege to come and discuss matters of environment which we consider a divine mandate. We commit now the next two days of this meeting into your holy and capable hands. We pray that you unite us in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, provide guidance in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have prayed. Amen. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I say all protocols have observed. I greet all of you. On behalf of the board for Center for Environmental Justice, I wish to welcome you and convey my humble gratitude for this rare opportunity to share some remarks and reflections ahead of the Environmental Protection Dialogue two days that we will be here. The guest of honor and distinguished invited guest. As we have learned, the master ceremony. The dialogue theme is towards the sustainable mining sector in Zambia through green investments for nature and people. As the board for the Center for Environmental Justice, we are delighted because the, the theme itself speaks to the founding mission and purpose of the Center for Environmental Justice. I must mention that the Center for Environmental Justice, its own vision is a safe environment as a basic fundamental human right. So we're looking at the environment as it is enshrined in our, in our constitution as the basic human right. And also, I think as we all know, environment surrounds everything that is uh, meaningful to human being, nature, and also a sustainable environment that we all wish. Center for Environmental Justice equally has been involved in several other initiatives. In particular, I may mention in the extractive industry, water sector, as well as programs and campaigns towards environmental conservation and protection in cooperation with several partners, among others, Bread for the World Germany and the Civil Society Environment Fund, CCF1, that was supported by the Finnish Embassy here in Zambia. Particularly in partnership with Bread for the World, allow me to state that SAGE has supported the communities and stakeholders in Sinazongwe district in Southern Province to come up with a district corporate social environmental responsibility plan where all their priorities have been identified and outlined. Without wasting too much time, I am now privileged to call upon His Excellency um, Jacek Jankowski, um, Ambassador from the European Union, to deliver to us. Um, it's a privilege and an honor for me uh, to be with you today at this first National Environmental Protection Dialogue. And uh, I would like to greet the Center for Environment Justice for its 10th anniversary and uh, for organizing this event. Honorable Minister, uh, your presence at uh, this event shows clearly the Zambian government's commitment to engage in a dialogue with the civil, uh, civil society organizations and other stakeholders in the environmental sector. We really need uh, such a leadership on this issue. Um, the EU and the donor community welcome His High, High His Excellency President Edgar Lungu's statements uh, made during the, the official opening of the first session of the 12th National Assembly. We very much support uh, the government's objective towards the development of a more resilient, diversified, climate smart economy which links very well with the three Ps, planet, people, 
and prosperity. Honorable Minister, dear participants, uh, the European Union uh, is very much engaged in what we call the environment, the European Green Deal. And it's really the first Europe's priority, Europe's political priority. And it's our new growth strategy. It aims at, it aims at becoming the first climate neutral continent by 2050. With the Green Deal, the EU and its member states underline their very firm commitment in the Paris Agreement on climate change and the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, that are enshrined in Agenda 2030. The transition uh, towards climate neutral and climate resilient Europe by 2050 entails the vision of a prosperous, modern, and competitive economy, leaving no one behind. Climate change is an urgent challenge for humankind and its future. It is of paramount importance to act together, and we need to cooperate with all our partner countries uh, to join Europe in this exciting journey. This ambitious goal is clearly translated in the EU communication, which is called Towards a Comprehensive Strategy with Africa, dating in fact last March. I commend the Centre for Environment Justice and its partners for facilitating and keeping up discussion on environmental matters even while tackling the challenges brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. We must not forget about the environmental megatrends that continue to be there and continue to determine our present and our future. Civil society has an important role in complementing government efforts in environmental matters. Over the years, Finland has supported civil society in Zambia in many different ways. The Centre for Environment Justice is one of the organisations that benefited from the programme that was uh, mentioned here earlier, CSEF, Civil Society Environment Fund. And I am so pleased to see that you have really continued to grow and gain momentum and keep up your good work. And it is a great joy to be in your midst as we gather for this Environmental Protection Dialogue 2020 under the theme towards a sustainable mining sector in Zambia through green investment for nature and people impact. The Council of Churches in Zambia is gratified that an entity the CEJN that we began to interact with as far back as 2011 uh, during the preparations for the youth participation uh, in the We Have the Faith campaign uh, towards the UNFCCCC COP17 in Devon has blossomed into a very credible institution. They were very, very devoted uh, during uh, the preparations and mobilization of the young people around the issues of climate change justice in Zambia. I would like to commend and recognize this commendable work uh, that they've done, guest of honor. It is very, it's not easy for young people uh, and organizations that are youth-led to survive for 10 years and culminating with a gathering of this nature. I, I think we need to give them a clap uh, for that kind of consistency and hard work. It is easy to be bought off. It is easy to be used as tools of violence and be involved in all kinds of vices. So to see a youth-led uh, institution like CEJN accountable, uh, being able to build and work with credible partners, that is a commendable uh, kind of achievement. The dialogue is an interface. It is a platform that is focused on conflict resolution. 
The focus of the dialogue is on seven key issues that are presented by each one of these seven uh, pop-ups around this year, or pull-ups. It is believed that these seven issues have been, have been arrived at through issue-based research, both from government institutions and also civil society. And these issue-based issues, research, this issue-based research addresses, addresses the issues from a social corporate responsibility perspective. So the, the model in which the dialogue is, is engaged, the model in which community engages the, the organizations on the ground is through social corporate responsibility. This engagement is supposed to be the benefit of man and nature, as it has already been put, and then we, we actually are focusing on a community-based intervention approach in our, in our engagement, starting with the, the mining communities themselves, country-wide or against great opportune time and privilege for me to join you and grace the National Environmental Protection Dialogue, whose theme is towards a sustainable mining sector in Zambia through green investment for nature and people. This is an important event as it comes shortly after the President of the Republic of Zambia, Mr. Edgar Chagwarung, delivered a statement at the Summit of on Biodiversity during the Leaders' Dialogue on addressing biodiversity, biodiversity roles and mainstreaming biodiversity for sustainable development. This event confirms that sustainable Management of the environment is important to both government and uh, the general citizen. My government has shown interest in seeing part of this event, having considered that the main objective of this dialogue is to create an action oriented platform for engagement of government, traditional leaders communities, cooperating partners, civil society, organization, academia, youth, and women to inform the development of initiatives to protect the nature and people. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm aware that the Center for Environment Justice has convened the Environmental Protection Dialogue to share experiences from their project implemented in Southern Province with the support from the Braid for the World, Germany. Furthermore, Center for Environment Justice has conducted evidence-based research about communities living around and within mining areas with support from the Civil Society Environment Fund, which is an environmental fund basket for government of Finland. I'm informed that the, environment, the Environmental Protection Dialogue I'm officiating and launching today will be an annual event or dialogue to ensure that there is sustainable exchange of experiences and information on how we can safeguard the environment while enhancing people's livelihood. The years this year's dialogue, that EPD 2020, is being supported by the Bread for the World, German, WFF Zambia, and Action Aid Zambia. At this point, I wish to recognize the commitment by the Bread for the World, German, who has committed to support this event for the next three consecutive years. As government, I wish to encourage nature caring partners to join the Break for the World and the, the Center for Environment Justice in supporting initiatives that are aimed at protecting the environment for the good of humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, 
government alone cannot address environmental ch challenges. And I wish to encourage all stakeholders, including government line ministries, the, pri the private sector, including mining firms, civil society organizations, traditional leaders, and communities to dialogue and gen uh, generate common solutions to Zambia's environmental challenges to ensure that sectors such as mining continue to operate in a more sustainable manner that benefits to affected local communities is at the center of our actions. I'm therefore optimistic that uh, the dialogue will focus on finding win-win solutions that can address both environmental challenges and well-being of our communities. As you may be aware, key threats and drivers of decline of nature resolve around uh, land use changes and sustainable food production and reforestation. So how do we tell? How can we say, no, now we have built resilience in our agricultural system. So even if we have drought or we have flood, we'll be able to produce food. We have built resilience in our energy system, for example. Even if we don't have water to generate electricity, we won't suffer the blackouts. So we need to have indicators that would help us track progress on building resiliency in the system. And it, this is the third and final area of work that is being done through consultancy to develop indicators that will help us to measure progress on uh, adaptation. The final component I want to touch on in terms of reporting on the implementation of the National Policy on Climate Change is legislation. As you know, policies are more effective when they are backed by law. So we've already commenced to work on developing legislation on climate change. Cabinet gave approval in principle in 2019 and for the whole of this year we have been working on developing a draft climate change bill. We have an advanced version which is the second draft of on the climate change bill and we are now at a stage where we will be coming to you stakeholders for you to have an input to look at the bill and provide us input in terms of the content that it has. We had undertaken initial consultations just on the scope, just the framework where we indicated that the bill will address the following issues and that was the scope of the climate change bill. But we do now have content of that. We have a draft that will be subjected to stakeholder consultations. These will provide legal backing, including to the structures that I mentioned in terms of the institutional framework, but it will also make our response more effective because then we'll have the backing of the law in our response to climate change. So your Royal Highnesses, distinguished participants, these are the few things I thought I could touch on to indicate how much we have moved in implementing the national policy on climate change. My question is really on the number of areas and the column combine, because that's the area where I'm coming from. I would really wonder as whether well, those two companies pay tax to the government. I'm saying so just for the people of us to know also, because the road which leads to Mamba Mine and Kulam Mine is not there. The environment around that road is completely destroyed. So my major uh, reason of uh, asking is to really know from you if at all you have an idea as well as Very beginning, you said you mentioned to us, you mentioned to the house, you say uh, there is a certain company which was in vending tax. I don't know this company the way they were in vending tax. I just wanted there if you could shed more light and second. I don't know the way they tax, the way we do it or we can do it as a country, a uh, white type of mechanism, or where you can work. Do they apply tax before production or after production when it comes to mining taxation? 
That's my question. In the old days, how did society protect the land? For example, where I come from, there was a, doom, a story of a human beast called Chishmukulu. So the Chishmukulu was an imaginary uh, beast which uh, was said to be in the forest, for example. And if you go there, it would uh, it moves with a boiling pot. So that prevented the people to go in the forest or to distract and that preserved uh, our natural resources. But it is therefore our responsibility as uh, traditional leaders to ensure that the environment is not abused by those who use this land or the environment in general. We are also responsible for making sure that our people, our community are sensitized. They must know the dangers posed by endangering the environment. Uh, we are also responsible for making sure that we coordinate activities with the government, NGOs, individuals, churches, and all those. It's important that we do that. And uh, we must also lead by example. And the topic, how does the role of the youth fit in, in protecting the natural resources, because I thought that was the discussion. And also, how do the royal establishment fit in this taxation? Because I'm, I'm aware that the taxation is on finished products. How does it impact on the royal establishments? So, in terms of flora, for example, they may cover up some forests as protected forests. Nobody is allowed to go there and cut trees and work within those forests because they are protected. They are protected as natural resources for the land for use later on, like making canoes and uh, probably fetching poles for building royal houses and things like that. There are certain trees, tree species which are protected. Fruit trees, for example, are not allowed to be cut down, to be hewn down, because they have a special function within the, the society provide food stuff when, when it is necessary. They are also protected game species, El Elan, for example. When we, are, we people who are affected by mines, I don't know how you want us to talk about how we protect the natural resources, how we protect the environment. When actually, what happens is, like the Induna has explained, an investor will come, he will walk over to any government ministry there, get all what he wants to do because they say that you have only land surface, land surface rights, and what is underground where you are sitting is not yours. And then to ask me to say how are you going to protect the thing you are telling me is not mine, becomes very difficult. And so the first thing to harmonize in this symposium is to make sure that we come up with policies that are going to take back the protection of the environment and natural resources back to the owners who are the chiefs and the traditional Without that, next year, come the other year, we shall sit here again to talk about resolutions of how to protect land and to protect the environment. So to these workers, I also want to say that whatever, whatever we, the natural resources are in a particular land in Zambia or wherever, they, it is the inheritance of the local people. And the local people under the headmen and their chiefs 
are supposed to protect it. But the conflict of interest that has hit our country in terms of the control and the levels of administration are very, very threatening. The government understand the challenges from the chiefs. From the chiefs. I'll tell you why. Uh, I had said already in the morning, the chief have, the chiefs have no power. They always give you the they have no power. The chiefs are not respected at all for your information. We are not respected. It is because look, chiefs are running a many many governments in that chief. We are running many governments because in my in every system there is a very line ministry. So the chief has he should have a say on certain things. If the chief says no, it is no by law. But if they think a chief can be challenged in court of law by a subject, and the government is quiet, where is our protection? So there is a big challenge. Although we are although we are quiet, but we are being challenged by our own subject, and the government is quiet. So the government will stand every day on the platform and say, chiefs must work on the government with the government. Yes. But with understanding that the chiefs must be understood also. We have a problem. May I just say, if there are issues, let's this, this bring them in because we, we are trying to dialogue with you. So if you have issues, we are here to listen. I'm sure that we are here to listen to all these challenges that you are facing. Otherwise, uh, we are not to be um, I feel when there are such challenges in the I think uh, the chief, this, uh, the district commissioners, police, uh, forest officers, they have to sit down in a stakeholders meeting. What I see is that uh, all these challenges that the chiefs are facing, like they, they can't even choose to the chief them, should come from the Today we've come for environmental dialogue, protection dialogue. And uh, today when I look at this way, protection dialogue, or to say environmental, it's a big weight, it's quite a very wide weight. In the sense that we are here to ensure that we submit where we are lacking. And um, the Center for Justice and Environmental Protection, the CJ, they have made it possible that this is the first time of this meeting to call all of us, especially us from different areas, and we can say the whole country, we are here. Now the question that was raised by His Royal Highness, my Chief, Chief Joma, is a, it's a question of it's a question of consent to my office and uh, definitely as the Royal Highness have done in our submission under the Environmental Protection Dialogue, we are going back also. We have got many channels in the government, the structures in the government that are structures in terms of reporting and also how we dialogue with the Royal Highnesses, beginning with also the uh, Indian and senior Indian in the process of that nature. So I would like to say that the concern of the Royal Highness, especially Choma, Choma has got a very big challenge, especially in issues to do with climate change. And uh, the dialogue that the Royal Highness has brought in is a very serious, which nobody would say no. It's a very serious matter that I would definitely take into consideration, even as we go back, we'll be able to call what we call the HOD stakeholders meeting to ensure that these are able to tap. When it comes to issuance of licenses that are to go with land and uh, resources, because what's happening now is traditional leaders are being rendered irrelevant in terms of some licenses, if not most licenses that are issued in Lusaka. When they come into the chiefdom, they are just coming to ask for permission to work in the chiefdom. Otherwise, everything has already been done. They have already been empowered with that paper. That paper has been signed by our authorities in Rosario. If the chief turns it down and refuses that, that person carrying that paper, it is termed like the chief is against development. Chief is of 
will see concrete actions uh, being developed and being acted upon with regards to the various recommendations that have been brought through the various uh, uh, dialogue forums which were taking place from morning through uh, to the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.